Kim. So now, my friends, strap in. We have another author in here. And you guys uh, know I love to read. You know that I interview a lot of authors on the show. And so we're now going to interview the author of a new book called Gideon, The Sound and the Glory. Uh, Joseph Gancy, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Doc, I, I, for having me here. Um, it's kind of exciting to get out the, the word of Gideon. I, I didn't do this as a moneymaker. This book was done for the glory of God, that all will know that there is a God in Israel. When they see the connections that are made and that continue to be made today with this story. Well, you know, I believe that this story, if it's not taught in war colleges, it ought to be taught because it's a masterful strategy story of battle. Um, but Gideon's one of my favorite guys, and, and I don't know where you want to go with this, but I know that one of my favorite stories is the angel shows up, Hail, thou man of valor! And Gideon looks around and see who's there. <laughs> Who are you talking to? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, I, I, I love that because Gideon didn't see himself the way that God saw him. No, most of God's heroes uh, shrug the mantle when it's first presented to them. They can't believe that they would be called of God for these extraordinary feats and actions. You had mentioned the angel. The angel also told him, you will conquer the Midian Empire as if but one man. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting phrase, don't you think? Uh, that is an interesting phrase. And I, I, now that you mentioned it, I, I didn't uh, dwell on that when I read the story. And I'll tell you how that fits in. You'll like this. And Gideon's base story, as most people know the name Gideon, uh, but not really familiar with his exploits. He's got a book series. You can pick it up in many hotels. Well, we were just talking about that. Uh, the Gideon Bible. I'm being a little silly here, guys. Yeah. Uh, you guys, uh, you, you, you know that. <laughs> the Gideon Bible, and I finally got to see a Gideon Bible. It's the Gideon Society that places Bibles in hotel rooms for people who are distraught or thinking of suicide or or they're reaching out, and they could find God in the drawer. There he is. Well, there's a lot of road warriors out there, and they're getting a little tired of the road, and they reach in that drawer, and thank God there's a Gideon's Bible. I pulled many of those out and marked my favorite scriptures in them. Yes, uh, it's in the Psalms. My comfort comes from the Word of God. The Lord is with me, but my comfort comes from the rod and the staff, which is the Word of God. The rod is the book of uh, Judah, which is uh, the Old Testament, and then the book of Joseph, the New Testament, becomes one uh, in your hand. Uh, that's what Ezekiel says. So I looked at the Gideon Bible, and there was the uh, Psalms, the Proverbs, and the New Testament. So Gideon is not in Gideon's Bible, which I thought was kind of surprising <laughs> since that, that's how most people know Gideon. And, of course, uh, the, the reason why they chose that name was because they wanted to distribute the word of God, and they realized they were very small, but they expected that God would bless it and multiply it, which it did. It did. And so we're grateful to the Gideons for what they do. And and uh, I didn't realize until today that uh, the Gideons Bible did not contain the entire Old Bible. Time. Yeah. and I think the new ones do, but the originals didn't. But I know the, uh, the New Testament, for those of you that wonder, is supported by the Old Testament. Without the Old Testament, the New Testament lacks a certain amount of validity, in my opinion. Credibility, yeah. It's in the mouth of the second witness the matter shall be established. So the New Testament establishes uh, Jesus as the Savior, as the coming of Christ. Let me, let me continue with my thought about... Go, uh, go ahead. Uh, you con conquer the Midian empires, but one man. If you look at the Bible, Gideon is in three chapters, chapters six, seven, and eight of Judges. Mm -hmm. And it's exactly 100 verses in those three chapters, which I was kind of surprised when I, who would even bother to count them? But since I'm writing the novel, it was like <laughs> writing a novel to, to a postcard, right? And so I'm counting it. And then, and then if you look at Gideon's base story, he takes 300 mighty men, Mm -hmm. who have no fear, whose hands are clean, and keep their eye on the horizon. Those are the 300. And he takes them, 
at the beginning of the second watch, which is midnight. He's going to attack the Midianites, 142,000 at midnight. The Midianites at midnight. God's sense of humor, I think. And he takes God his, has a sense of humor. It's, he puts it, those little Easter eggs in there for us to find. It's dry as the Sahara Desert, but it's there none the same. Yes. Uh, he takes his 300 and he splits it into three 100 groups. Now, if you look at the cover of the book, he's got Gideon's got a lamp in his hand. Only the King James says the lamp. All the other uh, 128 versions, I believe, say torches. Mm -hmm. And the reason it couldn't be a torch is because you couldn't put a torch in a picture. If you look at the bottom of the cover, you see a little broken picture. Mm -hmm. It had to be already lit when they got out to the field. Everybody forgot their Zippos. No, you couldn't, <laughs> you couldn't spark it out there, so it already had to be lit. He takes his 300, and he splits them into three 100 groups. What does he do that? Well, to make it look like there's even more of them spread over a larger area. Well, so they, do, we, do we dare break down the battle, how that actually worked? Because I, to me, this is one of the stories in the Bible that would make a great movie, and it doesn't require any embellishment. No, or just the way it's written, just the way it's written. Yeah. But let me finish the um, he takes the 300 he splits it into three 100 groups to make it look like there's even more of them. Of course, the enemy's thinking torches, not who's going to be out there in the middle of nowhere with a lamp. They're making so much noise and they're so far away. How many are there? Right? And they're between a hill and a mountain. So it's like an echo chamber. But the, the other reason he, he splits up his three, because it re represents the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit acting as one man in perfect harmony and coordination with the, with the sa exact same goal. And so now you have three verses, uh, three chapters, 100 verses, 300 men split into three 100 groups. I believe this is the true nature of God. I, I've never heard it explained like that. I, uh, I like the fact, I mean, Gideon, when he was originally called upon to do this task, he wanted to make sure that he was going to be a success. And so uh, he got as many men as possible to do this, and God, uh, God said, no, uh, that's too many men. Yeah, it was um, 32,000 initially. And God said, no, because if you, con if you accomplish this with that many men, you'll think you did it and not, and not me. So this way I'll make it impossible for anyone to doubt that it's my hand that, con that conquers the victory, that makes the victory. And, and so that's what he did. God said, you got to winnow these guys down. And, of course, I, you, you cover that in the book. I haven't read the whole book yet. Uh, but it's a fascinating story how God said, okay, this is how you're going to choose. Do you, do you have any enlightenment on it? Because it seems kind of kind of strange. Uh, Especially in the King choose. James. If you read the King James. Which it, is my personal favorite. Yeah, mine too, by far. I, I think it's, it's, even though it's Elizabethan English, I believe Elizabethan is the most perfect form of the English language. You know how I could say that, that with confidence? The other great work that's done in Elizabethan English is Shakespeare. Yes. And you don't see 128 versions of Shakespeare. You would lose the depth, the metaphor, the poetry. And that's what's intriguing about the King James. You see God's hand all over it. Well, you do. And, of course, we used to use that to teach reading and writing. And that's why today the finest novelists with the biggest selling books don't write as well as George Washington did. Oh, I agree. Yeah, I agree. The, some, well, that's... Personal taste, people basically, they don't like the King James because it takes work. And I tell them, look, the greater the effort, the greater the reward. Stick with it. The promise in the scriptures is that it will enliven your mind. Well, of course, if you, if you read it on a regular basis, pretty soon it reads just like a newspaper. It does. <laughs> and that's why I also, I, I actually enjoy the 1611 version of the King James. Oh, the original, yeah. Once you get used to, I remember the first time I looked at it, I said, this is hard. But the more I read it, uh, the easier it became. And it got to where I had no problems with it all reading 1611 King James English. And Shakespeare, too, becomes easier once you read it. It just it flows. Now the whole thing flows. But the depth of the metaphor, because God gives you several levels of understanding. He gives you what your ability is to understand. So every time you read it, no matter how many times you read the Bible, you're going to see something new. 
There's uh, also yeah, I love I love uh, going to a service and they got some old preacher in there. He's like 80 years old, and he gets up into the pulpit and he says, uh, "I was looking over the Word today and I saw something in there I'd never saw before." This guy's 80 years old. He's been reading the Bible for his whole life, and it's still fresh and new. You know, in the 23rd Psalm, when he said, um, "I make it, I make you through to lie down in green pastures." Mm -hmm. You like that? Your last name is yeah, green. Psalm you know why it's green? because it's fresh and alive. God's word is not ancient and dusty. It's pertinent to this moment and today, fresh and alive like green grass. Indeed. Uh, so you wrote this book on Gideon. I, nobody's ever written a book on Gideon that I'm aware of. I think there's a couple that's popped out, but nothing, 110 pages or something, uh, basic story. There's uh, The problem when I started writing it, I got to like 26,000 words and I'm going, where am I going to go with this? There's no more of information, right? So then I stretched it out to 36,000 words, and I went to a writer's conference, and they said, oh, no, we won't talk to you until there's at least 60,000. I'm going, 60,000? How am I going to drag 60,000 words out of 100 verses of uh, information? And little by little, God bless me. I prayed. I prayed every morning. It was like, I'll, I'll tell you, Doc, writing this book was like going to the top of a mountain every day where no one had been before. It was really quite intimidating initially go like, because I'm checking Google, yes. you know, a, a thousand years hence, the anthropologist will conclude as a society, they all commune with an all knowing Oracle named Google. <laughs> oh, help me, Jesus. Oh, my <laughs> well, that's God. it. Well, you got to, I had to be blessed, but Isaiah talks about it. Uh, line upon line and precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. And it's specifically talking about revelation. You gather this information and you put it together and then it reveals itself. Well, I, I am very excited to read the entire book and, and I've just had a lot going on because around Christmas I have a lot of things that I have to do besides this show. <laughs> I'm sure. And so uh, I have, I've had a limited amount of time to read. Crystal said if we focus on our differences... Our focus is on each other, but if we focus on our unity, then our focus is on God. Absolutely. I, I like to think of um, when every man, woman, and child becomes your teacher, you're starting to get the sense of humility. You know, humility is like underwear. Did you know that, Doc? <laughs> no, I'd never heard that. Well, it's essential unless it shows, and then it's indecent. <laughs> Well, I, I personally am most proud of my humility. So, uh, there's politics in the novel too. I mean, this is a this is a season right now of a huge amount of rancor and enmity and and pull and shove. But you could see, I like to go. I'm I'm writing to David now. I'm writing the sequel on this. And uh, Solomon said, "There's nothing new under the sun." Uh, yes, and uh, a lot of things have happened since then, and that's still as true as the day it was written. And we're not talking about technological issues. Yeah, there's going to be a, an, an iPhone 27 uh, uh, if God waits that long. But um, when it comes to mankind, that is absolutely true. But I'm intrigued. I mean, like uh, Chapter 17, Camels and Carnivores. What a great name for a chapter. Uh, wolves. There was a um, that was an interesting uh, segue. The um, car, uh, there's a main battle that's not addressed in the Bible. Gideon. The main battle is not addressed, and Gideon's not in the main battle. And if you start, I, I saw that on the internet. Some scriptorian had mentioned. He says, "I can't believe no one has ever mentioned the main battle." And I go, "What is he talking about?" And I started piecing little pieces together, um, uh, the Rock of Oreb mm -hmm. and the Wine Vat of Zeb. Now, Isaiah talks about the Rock of Oreb and, and the Wine Vat. He doesn't say Wine Vat of Zeb, but the Rock of Oreb is where Prince Oreb, mm -hmm. who was one of the Midian generals, his head was cut off and then brought down to the, uh, to the Beth Barah. But his head was cut off up north. So that means the army was still up north when the kings took off and there what had to be another battle. Ephraim had come up and all the men that Gideon dismissed joined in that battle. Ah, you see, and it had to be. And then 
the thing that got me started, one of the things that got me started in the beginning, it says, Gideon sends a message to Ephraim, and he says, take them to the waters, even the Beth Barah. Mm -hmm. They're going like, well, what the heck does that mean? I'm thinking. I'm I know old. Beth means house. I don't know yeah, what yeah. means. Right off the top waters, of uh, ferry. House of water. Yeah. So it would be um, the shallow waters of the Beth Barah. That was the crossing point. So everybody knew that's where you crossed over the Jordan at the Beth Barah. So he's telling Ephraim, which is 20 miles from there, to, to come down and catch them. He's going to drive the kings mm -hmm. like hounds to the hunter to Ephraim who's going to be waiting for them, except he didn't know that <laughs> Ephraim already had come up and uh, that was engaged in the battle as he's chasing the kings down. So I, I put all that together. And the other question, well, was, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you know, see, I don't want to give away the plot of the book. Uh, you know, Crystal probably has read the Bible. She's familiar with the story of Gideon. I'd be interested in the chat room how many of you guys are actually familiar with the story of Gideon. But it's, it's always been one of my favorites because this is a case where God took just a regular run-of-the-mill guy, but a, a guy, that, you know, that had a heart for God and, and a guy that God felt like he could trust. Um, the story of the fleece. That's a good one. Oh, that's, yeah, that's a delicious story. The um, uh, one, he, and he kept asking God. He was nearly never quite sure until his faith was manifested into practical reality. You know, we're saved by um, uh, faith is things hoped for but not seen. So yes. dispute not because you see not. For you get no witness until after its consummation. So it had to be consummated several times. It had to manifest itself. And then slowly Gideon finally goes, all right. <laughs> well, how many of you have ever, ever heard the term or someone said a phrase, well, I've, I've put a fleece before the Lord. Uh, that's where this comes from. And uh, it's, it's rather interesting, but I guess it also shows us that it's not a sin for us to question God's will for our life. No. Put and, me into remembrance. The Lord asks us. Put, it, put me into remembrance. What do you want from me? You know, hey, okay. I didn't know. You got to tell me. Like, he's like our dad. So what do you want? Tell me. Put me into remembrance. And that's, I think I see that with the fleas. He did it twice, so that there would be no doubt. Uh, yes, and, and uh, well, should we tell very quickly the story of the fleas? No, we're going to do it on the other side of this break, because i got to be fair to the guys that pay for the advertising. You bet. I'm a little behind. So uh, let's go ahead and run those ads. Uh, once again, please support the advertisers on my show. Raul Reyes, who's running for Congress out there, he's a good guy. I wouldn't take his advertising unless he was a good guy. And Joe Dana for Sheriff, once again, same deal. And we'll be right back on Right Side of the Mic. And we're going to tell you the story of the fleece. Be right back. I thought my system was working. And we're back here in the remaining moments of the show. We got Joseph Gancy here. So the story of the fleece. Uh, let's go ahead and hit that real quickly here in the remaining uh, few minutes that we have of the show. Joseph Gancy, author of the new book, Gideon, The Sound and the Glory. Anytime I get overwhelmed with worry, I try to remember that Moses started off as a basket case. <laughs> That's right. The fleece was Gideon's confirmation. He needed a confirmation. He's still not sure. The scriptures say he was least, um, uh, least, least in his father's house. He was poor in Manasseh, right? But he mm -hmm. had 10 servants. Anybody with 10 servants was not poor. He was poor in Manasseh, but he didn't live in Manasseh. He lived in Issachar. Yeah. He was rich in Issachar, but poor in Manasseh. He was the least regarded in his father's house. He was sort of like the go-to kid, you know, mm -hmm. like uh, Gideon, go do that. Gideon, go do that. And he was very, he was a big guy, and he would just 
agree. He would never put up an argument. So when God asked them to do this, this was like, this was like over the top, you know, not me. He just had a hard time letting go of his insecurities, his emotional dependence. He had to let all that go. It was more of an inner battle than an outer battle initially. So the fleece, he caught, he, he puts out the fleece and he wants God to confirm his, uh, orders. Mm -hmm. did, did, did I really see an angel? You know the problem with the spiritual. Yeah, an angel spoke to this guy, and he's not quite buying it. He's so not, he says, "Okay, he, I'm going to lay out a fleece, and when the dew of the morning comes, I want the dew to be everywhere on the ground, but not on the fleece." And he woke now. Up. How does that happen? Well, a kid can't unless God intervenes. God, right. So he comes out there, and uh, it's no dew. And he's, then he's still not sure. Well. Maybe there was some kind of other phenomenon that went out because it was the flea questioning. He's questioning the physical conditions that that made that happen. Mm -hmm. He said, well, let me reverse that, that there'll be uh, dry everywhere else, but, but the, the fleece, fleece will be, will be wet. wet. Would do. So the ground will be dry. The fleece will be wet. Comes Only back the next morning. And there it is. He's got to wring dry. out. The, it's so much water in the fleece. It's wet. It had to be <laughs> wet. They also use the fleece. Uh, I have this with Joab. You, they would use the fleece to pan for gold. Wow. That is huge. I didn't know that. So, well, I've only got 30 seconds left, guys. Look, I recommend that you go and get this book. Uh, right now, you can go to gideonsglory.com. That is the website, and you can. Where else can we get this book, Joseph Gansey? Amazon has uh, got it. Um, audio, uh, Kindle, soft cover, hard cover. All and right. If you look at the back of the book, that's Gideon's F out of gold. No one's ever seen one before because they couldn't figure out why it became an idol. But people's perception changed, not the physical. And it was forty-three pounds of gold, but it wasn't gold plate. It was gold thread. Wow. 43 pounds. All right, guys, get a copy of the book, Amazon.com. Uh, go to the website, Gideon'sGlory.com, and thank you for being part of the show today. Thank you, Doc.